Good afternoon, everyone. Our topic today is user behavior hashing for audience expansion, and we are from Samsung. Our brief agenda today, uh, this is Praveen, and I'm Director of Engineering at Samsung Research America. And I'm going to be joined by my colleague or co-presenter, Inan, who is our lead data scientist at Samsung Research America. Together, we are going to cover our topic the user behavior hashing for audience expansion. So at first, I go and provide you a high level overview of Samsung, what we do. Next, I follow up with, I'll provide an architecture overview of Samsung audience platform, and I will introduce to our lookalike modeling. Then Inland would cover the rest of the topics with respect to the specific deep dive into how we accomplish lookalike modeling using hashing techniques. And then we provide benchmarks and model performance, and then we can go through some Q&A. So we are Samsung, we are a global company. We have more than 300,000 diversified employees, and we also have global revenues to the tune of $220 billion. And more importantly, we are also operated at global scale, and we have 35 R&D centers across the globe. And our group specifically represents the global research group, Samsung Research America, and we are going to take a little bit deep dive of that. So Samsung research, I mean, these are some of the core areas of research for us. They start with artificial intelligence. This is where we focus more on hardware as well as software side of AI, and then followed by data intelligence. Given we are Samsung, we have huge amount of data sets. We also focus on our 5G and 6G all the technological advancements related to mobile. Then we also focus on robotics and Tizen is our operating system for TVs. And last but not least, we also focus on next generation display and media. So our specific example today is more deep dive into the next generation display and media. Now, because we talked about a whole lot of data that we at Samsung, we handle on day-to-day -day basis, Having a robust audience platform is absolutely necessary to handle these huge amounts of data. So with our audience intelligence platform, we focus on some of these core areas. We work on recommendations, we work on user modeling techniques, and we also work on multi-model techniques related to voice and vision. And all of these are also powered using our uh, AI experience. So as part of our audience platform, we work with both first party as well as third party data sources. So our first party includes the data that we collect from our consumer electronics devices that include TVs, mobile phones, IoT devices, et cetera. And when it comes to our third party data, it is obtained from TV networks, ads, and third party device graphs that we have and so forth. Now, what we do is we bring our first party data as well as third party data together into our data platform. So we proceed by following the steps of ingesting the data first using our batch as well as real time data processing. Then we store them uh, because the amount of data is so huge, we store for several months of data here. Once you ingest the data, we basically have our machine learning as well as deep learning platform. As part of our ML and DL practices, these are some of the uh, algorithms or approaches or problems that we solve on day-to-day -day basis. Those are related to lookalike modeling, problems related to recommendations and personalization, and again, some of the problems related to optimization as well as attribution, especially those two are uh, some of the problems related to the advertising space. And last but not least, some of the problems related to fraud detection, and also use natural language processing in order to process speech, voice, and all of those. Now, what is also supported by our ML and DL platform is also our model management framework and also our experimentation framework where we run a bunch of A-B tests on day-to-day -day basis. But once you have this AI or ML platform, we are going to have the uh, data visualization as well as APIs. Now, when you look from the right side of the picture, it is primarily the business applications. So through our platform, we support these core businesses. So Samsung Ads has been one of the tremendous growth drivers 
So this is the platform that basically supports it alongside our Samsung marketing. And we also have a lot of recommendations as well as personalization that is enabled on our TVs for our consumers. And many of those use cases related to multimodal and IoT. So those are the core business applications that are being supported as part of this platform. Now, if you focus on the bottom of the screen, there are five different stages. First, we start with audience discovery. This is where we ingest all of our data from, from all the devices, the user interactions and whatnot. The next phase is to basically do the high level segmentation, understand where exactly these audience are coming from, think about demographics, location, uh, et cetera. The, 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 it is followed by audience expansion. Today, we are going to focus on this as part of the rest of the session. Once you expand the audience, you would then be able to drill down into how you want to tune your audience to focus and target to some of those specific campaigns. And last but not least, how well you have uh, targeted is measured by the audience measurement techniques, especially attribution. Let's talk about lookalike modeling from Samsung context. So as part of the lookalike modeling, we have two different goals that we want to cover today. First goal is how we can improve our incremental reach. And second goal is how we can improve our targeting. Then we are talking from the perspective of two different use cases. The first use case being TV networks. The second use case is for Samsung new TV purchases. So let's actually dig deep into TV networks, what I mean here. Especially when it comes to new shows that air on different TV channels during fall premieres and so forth, how can you really go and identify some of those new audiences that replicate some of the behaviors of your existing audiences so this is where you think of, you know what, I have context of certain type of audiences and how I can make use of the user context and how I, how I can expand it to potentially identify newer audiences. Now, the same approach or methodology is similar for new TV purchase as well. Considering the existing TV universe, understanding who is already an existing 8K or 4K or QLED TV owner, understand from the perspective of what type of user behavior they exhibit and how could you really make use of it to find out who are your potential new TV purchasers. So these are the two main goals that we can potentially solve by using our user, by using our lookalike modeling techniques. When it comes to our approach, as part of Samsung, we have ACR viewership data, which we basically have from uh, 50 plus million TVs in US. And by applying user behavior hashing techniques, we would be able to identify those TV viewers that are similar to existing audiences based on user behavior. So let's look at, let's look at our lookalike audience expansion example. So on the graphic on the left, so imagine the full circle is our entire TV universe. Here we are specifically talking about how can I find those audiences that are similar to my existing TV owners? So as you notice, the uh, small circle on the left, which is A, so A is my seed audience. Now I want to find out those audience that are similar to that seed audience of A. And this is where it is highlighted as the dotted circle. Now, if we apply all of this to our hashing technique, what we would be able to determine is, we would be able to determine the circle B, which is an expanded segment of A. So using this, you would be able to figure out, given a seed audience A, how you would be able to figure out and identify the expanded set of B. To actually go into more details and how the hashing technique itself work, my co-presenter Inan would be taking it through from here. Thank you, Praveen. Uh, today is my great pleasure to talk about one of our previous works that related to audience expansion using lookalike technologies. Um, in this particular task, uh, we are trying to find and rank group of uh, similar users. Um, as you know, Samsung has a large scale of the user base, uh, including Samsung smart TVs and the mobile devices. And the, the user interaction data scale is huge. Uh, all this data, user interaction data are related with something uh, like content, linear content consumption, video on demand, 
uh, consumption, gameplay, application usage, and even interaction with external devices. Uh, because of this uh, large scale of data sets, it's, it's, it's actually uh, pretty important for us to derive an efficient algorithm uh, to, to find the uh, similar users. Although this, this task can be run offline, we still want to limit the uh, resources uh, spent on this particular task. Um, there have been a lot of works that in the industry to solve a similar problem uh, in large scale uh, to find uh, the K nearest neighbors, uh, nearest neighbor search. Uh, this one typical approach is called the uh, locality sensitive hashing, LSH. And uh, there are also uh, techniques related to uh, finding similar users in recommender system. Uh, however, uh, these type of approach, sometimes they don't uh, capture the uh, user's behavior change efficiently. Uh, they also uh, cannot capture uh, the contextual change uh, when the user have this kind of interaction uh, with the devices. So to solve those problems, uh, we have to define a very efficient hashing methods that can capture all the contextual information and preserve at the same time, preserve the similarity between users so that we can actually generate a bucketize user search space and that user, uh, we can search, uh, find the, uh, the most similar users in a timely manner. Uh, so this is the high level workflow uh, for this particular uh, use case we mentioned. Uh, first of all, we collect data from uh, Samsung first party and plus some third party data. And then we do some pre-processing pre on this behavior data. Uh, then we can get it into the deep binary hashing model that we're talking about. Uh, after running through this uh, deep hashing model, we will generate a heter heterogeneous hash, hash code for each user. Uh, this hash code is efficiently uh, is efficient to be used in fast search. Uh, for the particular uh, lookalike use case, uh, we can use the seed segment of users and uh, by bucketizing, bucketizing this uh, user hashing code, uh, we can uh, implement a fast search algorithm that can in a very efficient way to find the similar users in, so that we can expand the audience. Uh, even in an online and real-time uh, manner. Uh, but the training process and the hash code generation process, uh, we will run it offline. This slide shows the high-level uh, training flow that we used in mm -hmm. the hashing process. Uh, the training is based on user pairs. By utilizing external knowledge or predefined user similarity, we uh, generate two users uh, raw input and uh, this input will the input it will go through our uh, network layers. Uh, these network layers will be explained in the next few slides. After uh, we learn the user representations from these network layers, there's a hashing layer to specifically generate uh, the heterogeneous hashing hash code for each user. And uh, after the sign function uh, we mostly sigmoid we use here, then we can uh, predict whether the users are similar or not. Um, in, for, to solve this particular problem, we tried the different network architectures. This, uh, the workflow we talk about is not specifically to just one uh, deep network architecture. We can actually try a different architecture once uh, you can design it fit into the workflow. So today I'm going to talk about uh, two of them. The first one we call it is a time-aware attention uh, CNN model. Uh, in, in, this, in this model, uh, we have basically four layers. Uh, the input layer is the, is the data pre-processing layer. Uh, it's actually maps the, uh, maps the sequential behavior data into a 3D structure that can be processed by convolution neural network. Uh, because the behavior data is represented by user interaction with items, 
um, the first step we do in the preprocessing is to embed each item into a vector. So all in the second step we do is actually sessionize user's history into a different time uh, unit. Uh, for each session, we actually ag aggregate all the items uh, that the user uh, had interacted with using the uh, embedding of the items generated in the first step. And uh, the, uh, the, you, you can look at the, the, the three image down there. Uh, the H exercise axis is actually the, the short-term time unit we defined. The W axis is the long-term, the mid-term mid -term to long-term uh, behavior of user uh, time units. Uh, the the D axis is representing the uh, user the the different embed embeddings for uh, for different atoms. Uh, in this embedding layer, uh, usually it is uh, hand made. Uh, it means that it carries more actually conceptual information than uh, similarity information that we need itself. Uh, this actually would affect the overall performance of this uh, TNCN model. Um, especially uh, in its ability to preserve the similarity information. Uh, so to overcome this situation, we introduced a embedding layer as part of the model. Uh, this embedding layer applies a specific designed convolution kernel so that it can transfer, transform the previous layers output into a adaptive distributed representation. Uh, the next layer will be the time aware attention layer. Uh, this, this particular layer is used to abstract time aware attention uh, features in this model. Um, this layer separate attention features into the short term, uh, mid term, and long terms. Uh, short term features uh, are features abstraction that uh, emphasize users a small time scale, in a small time scale, maybe a day, maybe a week. A long term uh, features capture a longer term, maybe a month of uh, or season of a season kind of a, a time range that, that we try to capture users uh, uh, recent activities and long-term preference at the same time. Uh, the last layer will be the aggregation layer. Uh, aggregation layer, all features from the, uh, the previous layers will be flattened and concatenated together in this layer. This particular slide uh, explains the description of each layers uh, we mentioned previously. I don't make it. Beside the TACN model, we also introduced another deep neural network that is called a category attention model. Uh, so because the user's content consumption behavior are mostly related with, with uh, general information of content or type of information of applications. Um, this categorical attention model try to catch different preferences on user, uh, from user on different genres of content. Uh, so to efficiently learn uh, the correct user rep representation from sequential behavior, uh, so we want to build a hybrid attention network, cat a category categorical aware attention network. So this uh, proposed model uses a uh, attention mechanism uh, from the user behavior history uh, grouped by the item category, cate category information. Uh, from the group list, uh, this attention network can, dis can discover important items which are useful to represent users by their prefer preference. Uh, the reason we choose the attention versus uh, other networks such as LSTM, uh, RN, GRU, uh, is actually because of the attention's superior performance. Um, our network is actually uh, com also composed of uh, four layers. The first one is the sparse uh, input layer uh, that capture the uh, user, the item, the user's interact interactive uh, history uh, with the uh, items and uh, group them by categ category. Uh, the embedding layer that learns from these uh, item embeddings and uh, the attention layer that uh, computes the weighted sum over items embedding per category. And finally, uh, we combine all these uh, layers uh, on top of this uh, metadata attention layer 
the output of this particular layer represent the user's embedding. As a result, uh, the final user embedding will contain user's preference with a good reflection of the long-term uh, historical or behavior patterns. Due to the, uh, the large scale of the, the nature of the data we process, um, although this uh, similarity preserving hashing can be calculated offline, but we want to limit the time to update to, for each iteration so that we can update the user's hash code more frequently to capture their recent uh, behavior. Uh, at the beginning, uh, we have to use the, uh, when we run the inference, we use the Python UDF uh, and uh, clearly it is a very efficient uh, methodology uh, because it uh, runs as a row at a time um, manner. Uh, the good thing is Spark uh, introduced a pandas UDF uh, from a few iterations back. And uh, when we, uh, during that, this particular work, uh, we tried to utilize the pandas UDF uh, group map functionalities. Um, so pandas UDF is actually uh, the one of the, the biggest perform, performer uh, booster uh, from Spark. Uh, so they, they, uh, they actually performs um, more than 100% times faster than the traditional Python uh, UDF. They utilizing the Apache Arrow, Apache Arrow uh, exchange data very efficiently between the Java virtual machines and uh, these Python drivers. Uh, so in the next slide, yeah, I'm going to show you, uh, th this slide shows the uh, the code snippet that how we run the pandas UDF in a group map group map uh, manner. So uh, as as mentioned in the TACN model, all this uh, user behavior data was reconstructed into a three D uh, dimension, and we we we, we treated them as uh, images and uh, feed this into uh, the convolution neural networks. Uh, we we write this a uh, group map function. And then so that uh, for each particular group, we can utilize, in, we can apply uh, this uh, particular pandas UDF function. Uh, this improved our performance speed uh, 10 or 20 times uh, faster. Uh, one thing we noticed is, is actually the, the, for a group map data, we, we have to load all the group into memory. And uh, so we have to carefully select how we uh, control the memory so that it can uh, efficiently uh, run through all this large scale data that we, we need to process uh, without causing any exceptions. And eventually uh, this particular pandas UDF uh, improved the, the speed significantly. Um, we also evaluated uh, our two models versus some um, well-known uh, hashing or similar user search uh, approaches. And we measure this performance by accuracy. Uh, we, when, we, uh, do, when we did this in a POC phase, we, we ran through three different data sets. Uh, one is uh, movie, movie Lens. It is uh, very uh, popular in recommender system domain. The other one is a Goodreads dataset. It actually contains uh, users' book reading uh, logs for more than 10 years. And uh, the third dataset that we tried is uh, behavior data from uh, Samsung Internal. Uh, we compared these uh, two approaches with uh, LSH and NeuroCF, and the other approach called uh, uh, VDSH is also a way to generate user hashing. Uh, in all these uh, data sets, our model is actually outperformed in different uh, bit length of hash code. Uh, so the reason we run different bit length of hash code is to uh, have a way uh, that the longer of the bit length can, uh, can capture the user's profile more precisely. Uh, 
in, co in conclusion, in this particular work, we designed uh, a, novel, a novel deep memory hashing architecture, which can uh, utilizing a different type of uh, deep neural networks. Um, then this particular architecture help us to generate the similarity preserving a user hash code. And uh, this hash code can be efficiently used in uh, similar use search, uh, user search. And uh, our TACN model captures uh, the user's preference uh, with the different time scales and try to capture the user's recent activities and the long-term activities. And the other category of attention model uh, utilizing categorical information and also uh, captures users' time sequence behavior. And uh, the, mo mo the most important thing here is the PANAS UDF helped us to improve that the speed significantly so that uh, we can update the user's behavior hashing in a much more frequently manner. So I want to say thank you to all this uh, Spark Plus AI Summit 2020 participants. And uh, last but not least, uh, we also we are also hiring. SRA is hiring. Our team is also hiring. There are many different positions related to data engineering and the data science. If you're interested, please feel free to contact Praveen or myself through our email or LinkedIn uh, profiles. Thank you again. Okay.